Yeah, man. Oh, how's it been, brother? Good. How about you? All right. It's going on my own. It's pretty good. You know, it's pretty yeah. busy. Um, I, I recently signed a book deal with a small publisher, so I have to. I'm even busier now. So sick. It's all good. Yeah, man. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, do it. Do it. Like do, literally, do everything you have to do to survive in the content game. Exactly the content farm. Um, yeah. Yeah, but um, yeah, man. I know we wanted to do this for a while, so um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I guess um, to begin with, to get into it, uh, I guess real, really quick, just give your to the audience, give your CV, if you will. Let's like. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah, a I'm history. a normal guy. Yeah. I was on your I was on your other show that I guess doesn't exist anymore. Well, it's live and... show now. It's live show, so it's yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. There, but, yeah. So I was on there, and that's how we met. But I'm just a normal guy, you know. I'm a normal guy with a show called Wrong Opinion. It's on. <laughs> it used to be on Patreon. It's on Gumroad now. Patreon banned me, and um, I'm on Censored TV on Saturdays, and I too, I too am an author of some sorts i made an ebook for That's right. for young men called called the manual um but i'm i'm not really I, that's the thing like i'm not really a, i'm not a genius you know a lot of people on, on in in this world you know claim to be geniuses some are some are hmm. but i'm just a normal guy who who would not have a show if it, if it weren't for the fact that we're living in the weirdest dumbest most retirement human <laughs> history yeah that's true um I was gonna ask, like, what happened with you and Patreon? I'm, I'm kind of worried now. I'm on Patreon, so. Um, yeah. It was after you appeared on Infowars, yeah. if I recall. That was the big. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I it, I was on Info. It was like a year ago, actually. Yeah. A year ago, pretty much this week, I was on Infowars as a guest. And the nice thing uh, about Infowars is they will plug whatever it is you want to plug, as many times as as possible. Like. Yeah. Every time they come back from a commercial break, they're like, you can go on Josh Lacash's Patreon, patreon.com forward slash wrong OP. So they probably, and the hour I was there, they probably pu plugged it like 15 times. Yeah. And um, because of that, I imagine since it's Infowars, they get a lot of haters watching, hate watching. And oh, yeah. they, they, I was on Patreon for two years with no problems, no, no warnings, no strikes, nothing. And then an hour after appearing on Infowars, I get banned mm. for hate speech. So it was no coincidence. Um, and and they were nice enough to have me on again the next day to you know broadcast to the world I was canceled. And um, like it, it it worked out. It, yeah. The only times cancellations don't work out are if you go along with the cancellation, which is like you go along, you you concede. You, yeah, you you're apologize. like, okay, I'm defeated. You yeah. either you apologize or you give up and you're done. That's when you lose. But in reality, um, there's a wave after and you can ride it if it's if you so choose. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, did did Patreon give you any reason or was it just like you're like I think I'd imagine it was because like saying like in patreon.com <laughs> just the cash on M4 is I'd imagine that was yeah. like probably what it was. It was just bad. People yeah, there, it, so. definitely, it definitely. Yeah, it definitely was that. But really, it's, um, you know, they give you a vague without giving you any evidence. They give you, you know, a vague subjective reason. For me, it was hate speech. Yeah. And OK, well, I don't know what that means, but it's your word against mine. It's your platform against me. So not much I could do. The, the one thing I did was I emailed the support. And I said, I don't understand. I'm a comedian. Everything I was saying was was, you know, it was satire. I was making fun of conservatives. I'm actually gay. I I have a trans wife or, you know, I just like listed <laughs> off all these things and it didn't work. I thought maybe that would work, but it didn't work. No, no, it's probably. Yeah, it's probably that's what it was. It was just bad PR. And I think maybe you caught astray. That's usually like I think that happened to Sargon as well when he was kicked yeah. off. Um you can of course with Sargon it was when he started his political campaign and anytime you do any sort of like IRL activism they're more likely to like put the yeah. ban hammer on you like the truckers for instance they could go on page yeah I 
Yeah. Yeah, or like for for people like Andrew Tate. Yeah. Um, whatever you whatever you think about him, it's when you become effective. Like when when the only way to defeat someone is to suppress their access to platforms um, because they are so effective. Like mm. there's a lot of people out there on you know YouTube, wherever you know, and and it's they're not really bothered because they are either controlled opposition or they're not as persuasive like the moment you're really really persuasive yeah and you have the hearts and minds of especially young men they they are going to come after you really really hard yeah this is why this is why i stick to being a theory so because then nobody knows what i'm saying half the time so it's good um well what do you yeah do? yeah well but let's maybe we get in a little bit of andrew tate but uh I don't have a favorable opinion of him, but I guess like, well, you know, we'll get into it. But in terms of your, your background and your history, how did you start like, um, becoming like a, a, I guess you would say dissident podcaster. How, how did the whole, um, how did the, the red pill, like, I guess I know it's so cliche, you know, these terms, but yeah. how did the red pill odyssey happen for Josh? The Cat? Yeah. Yeah. My, my, my older brother has this friend who he is really like, old money very very wealthy in new york and he's a conservative and he follows me i don't even know what his twitter is because it's like anon and oh, yeah. we, we talk all the we talk all the time so he always like he always acknowledges when he sees what i post and he'll immediately text me after i post something but i don't know what his twitter is and and super wealthy guy um very funny and he's he's in his 40s i'm 36 and he um he knew my ex-girlfriend who is uh, the daughter of one of the most famous film writers of all time. And my ex-girlfriend, like I'm married with a kid and another baby in June, right. you know, but this girl I dated uh, is nine years older than me. And he, he's friends with her still kind of, I guess. And he'll, he, he'll always tell me that she, uh, I'm, she's like my joker. Like she, I'm Batman and she created me, you know, she made me into, she like created this, this whole thing of like the, the, the exact type of guy she hates. Uh, she manifested him into existence. And that guy is me. Cause I was dating her in like 2000, I was dating her in 2014 and she, uh, would say all this stupid feminist stuff that you would he like from the Gamergate era, you know, oh, that yeah. Whole the, thing. The, yeah. The coal yeah. of the yesteryear would, yeah. All the anti, SJW feminist. Yes. Yeah. So I was like living this oblivious, naive world, you know, where I was kind of a libertarian. I was living, let live, you know, the non-aggression principle, all of these fan like fantasy thing notions, you know, these we've all been ideas. there. Yeah. We've all been there. Yeah. So I'm I'm living that life and I'm dating this girl nine or ten years older than me or whatever. And and she starts like calling me a sexist and all these things for just saying things like i i told her i'm like oh women are more nurturing than men and you know it blew up into a whole argument whatever so she created me because she would attack me on just me saying these things i thought were universal truths you know mm -hmm. i was so oblivious i didn't know about you know the feminist movement i didn't know about the whole sjw so weird saying that because it's so it's so you know, yeah it's cliche it's like the it's yeah it's like that era of like Post it's, or pre gamer gate is like yeah man, even cool. that era was naive like i wish that was the problem today it's like so <laughs> so much yeah. worse now mm, but it's true so she would bring up all these things and i'm like that doesn't make sense but i have to look into it so the more i looked into everything the more radicalized i got and she radicalized me so really like she set me on this path of of you know massive red pill after massive red pill and i imagine it happened to many other men also mm. you know where we're just living our lives we just want to have fun we're just you know we Are don't know dating what, Sophia what's going Coppola? on is that who it was no, no i'm kidding, this I'm woman, kidding. <laughs> i'll tell you i'll tell you this woman her name she's an actress or i mean she hasn't been in anything in a while but uh her name's kate town feel feel free to google her her name's kate town um her dad wrote the movie chinatown Oh yeah. Uh, so, so he's he's and he's still alive somehow, but she had a up childhood. So I don't you know completely blame her for where she is. I mean, imagine growing up in Los Angeles. Imagine your dad 
is the most influential, famous writer pretty much of all time. And imagine your dad is best friends with Jack Nicholson. And imagine your dad and Jack Nicholson take you to the Playboy Mansion all the time, leave you there while they playmates. Like, oh, that's her upbringing. You're a little girl. You're eight years old. You're all alone in the Playboy Mansion while your dad and Jack Nicholson are playmates. So I can't... Uh, she, I can't imagine she would have had a, a, a different outcome. You know, I can't imagine she would have had a different trajectory where she wouldn't become the woman she is. Childless, has a cat, uh, miserable, uh, countless, uh, massive body count. Like, uh, uh, I mean, not to name drop, but it's, you know, I'm doing a show with you right now and mm. let's make it as interesting as possible. But, <laughs> but like Colin Farrell and I are Eskimo brothers. Um, uh, Charlie Hunman and I, you know, like, all, all these people that I have a weird connection to because we all dated the same uh, woman, broken woman. And, um, you know, I imagine that for a lot of women, um, you know, especially the modern day female, just they, they, they've all had that similar upbringing minus the celebrity yeah. sort of scenario, you know, like they, no father, uh, zero stable household. Uh, it's just non-existent. So, of course they're going to come out this way. Like all those women we make fun of on that show, whatever, on that whatever podcast, you know, where the, the, oh, yeah. the funny clip. Yeah, they, you know. Oh, is it the one the young girl be... like trying to explain like dating? Is that the, like I believe Cold yeah. Hearing shared that one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like all of that is funny, but it's also it's frustrating. It's tragic, really. It's really, yeah. It's tragic. Yeah. It's very frustrating because, you know, in order to have a stable and happy and prosperous society, you know, uh, I guess men are having some sort of awakening, but I also hope that women are too, but it just seems like both are completely lost. Both are completely miserable and they're doubling down on the, the madness that's making them miserable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you about it because I feel like, uh, a lot, a lot of your content is centered around this. Well, not centered around, but yeah, you know, I mean, it is, <laughs> I, you 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 were pretty infamous on twitter for um posting these tiktok videos and uh getting people angry and like i i guess yeah l like there was that one recently that got you in where it was the th women like doing the van life thing like that was, yeah. yeah 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 i didn't expect that yeah, people people are like men hate women just living their lives and i'm like but that's not they're <laughs> They're running away from, and I'm again. I'm not faulting them. They they are a product of the people that raised them or didn't raise them. Like I'm just on the sidelines saying this is kind of weird. This is a weird trend. Why are we doing this? Why why is this something to celebrate? Mm -hmm. And and they're like, you're miserable. You're miser. You seeing women be happy touch makes grass. you miserable. Yeah. Like, touch um, grass. Yeah, touch grass. And I'm like, look, but look at behind me. Like, this is a tropical paradise. There's a beach right behind me. I, I, I have a wife and a kid and another baby on the way. And and I am literally oh, touching grass. I'm touching ocean. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, you know, they, they like to they like to throw um throw this insult around like incel and all that. And it's like, okay, I'm the I'm literally practicing what I preach, and I'm just kind of wondering why everyone is running away from having a normal, stable, happy life. Mm -hmm. And, and there was another, okay. So this is my thing, I guess it's, I find these videos on TikTok. There was and, another one recently too. That was right. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I know the one you're talking so about. So the yeah. other one, cause okay. So the initial one you mentioned was women who live in a van and they drive across the country. They even at avocado is toast, very, which is pa painfully millennial. That's like my generation. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and and they're lesbians of course they're lesbians and or at least uh, they like, don't buy no at least man. yeah at least yeah. there's something going on there they don't need yeah. no man and they're living this free lifestyle and i i'm over here like angry at them and it's and okay fine i'm angry at them whatever whatever makes you you know well, whatever well, can't you just let them live laugh that. love josh i mean what's wrong with that right right yeah yeah i'm sorry that the target slogan has taken a hold of your life and it has shaped your whole uh, worldview and lifestyle, but but it's not real. It's not realistic. What I've noticed with TikTok is is any sort of category because you have the libs of TikTok stuff, which is yeah. always the tough and all of that, and it makes people miserable and it's psyoping the youth to adopt that lifestyle. You can find any category on TikTok 
And that app is designed to make you feel miserable. Like I did a whole episode mm -hmm. last yeah. week called Root Conspiracies because <laughs> the algorithm was feeding me. The algorithm was feeding me conspiracy theory after conspiracy theory, like the, 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 the lowest of the low, like the dumbest of the dumb conspiracy theories. And it kept feeding and feeding and feeding me this. And it does actually make you miserable. Like the, the algorithm does that. So it's not just the dangerous trans stuff. It's literally anything. But to go back to what I was saying, like the other video you were going to mention that mm. got me in hot water with people online. And this one is actually to me more interesting philosophically than the van life one was this girl walking around Central Park and she was saying, oh, my God, this is so cute. There's a father and a son playing catch. Oh, my God, there's this guy singing. Uh, yeah, this that one. Yeah. On... yeah. Life is life is beautiful. In other words, yeah. life is beautiful. There's a there's a, a, a band playing John Lennon um, songs, on, uh, you know, in the memorial where he died or something. And and so she's the, the, it's a minute long video and it's a very nice video. This very lovely young woman is, is just looking around at her environment and being and just happy. And I commented on it and people like you hate women that are happy. You're miserable. And again, the same sort of thing. And it's like, listen, just reread what I wrote because that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I'm actually complimenting her in a sense where I was saying um, the world can be on fire and a woman uncorrupted, a woman who has embraced her, her, the best um, feminine aspects that a woman can have, which is like just a very nice and, and nurturing type of personality like a graceful yeah nice and agreeableness woman. yeah yeah agreeableness mm -hmm. um she can be in the in, in the most crime infested area which i mean new york city isn't doing too well right now mm. and she could be looking at the world through rose-colored glasses and just be uh, be happy and i was saying that there's two realities we're living in and because of equality and because women have a seat at the table um we have uh, a, a a large segment of the population which are women and they are agreeable even in like the worst sort of environment they're agreeable to like bad influences uh we have them at the seat of the table feminizing society and i'm over here saying i actually like how she's looking at new york city but i don't think she should have a seat at the table i think she should take that energy and use it to like find a husband and it's, it's a shame that she's in new york city because it's probably most likely not going to happen and eventually mm -hmm. She's going to be corrupted by the shit around her. But because people are not curious and people just skim through what I wrote, they're going to attack me for attacking women. And that's like the furthest thing of what I was doing. Yeah, yeah. I think like, but in all fairness, I think that the the way that tweets are phrased or rather just the gen, like not even the way they're phrased so much as the medium itself is geared towards amplification of like certain... Um, a certain subtext that by definition grabs attention and gears like yeah. same with TikTok. TikTok like TikTok's even I think worse, like not being on it, but having friends like uh that are on it like multiple hours a day. The algorithm's designed to sort of um predicate certain types of use above others. Like that's the medium of it. And I think with Twitter is like yeah. that tweet, if like you can construe it as you were basically bombing on some innocent girl, but right. really your deeper meta point when you explain it is that actually um, in times of a strong civilization that is more or less homogenous, like let's face it, right? Um, and yeah. at times where society does have sort of a value that can allow for the best qualities of the feminine to flourish. And that's good, right? A woman like that's good. But in a time like we're living in now where things are fundamentally um, in some ways disordered, it's like that type of optimism in life is not probably the best view of it. Like, you know, I mean, it's an old like reactionary talking point, but it's, you know, hard time, yeah. <laughs> hard times create what saw people create yeah. hard times. Yeah. You know, like, uh, what's the, um, what's the meme one? Uh, uh so hard times create <laughs> good times, create <laughs> Wojak's Wojak's create yeah. hard times, yeah. hard times, create giga chads. Right. So there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you, you know what I mean? Like, I think like the subtext of that tweet is that you're like taking and you're viciously attacking this woman. Like, can you let people enjoy things? Can't you let women live, laugh, love? And it's like, I know. yeah, I, yeah. I didn't know I had that power, by the way. I didn't know I had the power to, um, you know, take away the joy out of the life of people. But um, <laughs> yeah, my favorite, my favorite is like, I'll write something like that. And people, people are like, you're miserable. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're you're a miserable person. And I'm like, I'm yeah. thinking it took me 30 seconds to write this tweet, knowing exactly what the reaction is. And I'm over here enjoying my life, you know, with my wife and kid. And, you know, we're, we're happy. We, we do touch grass. Um, but that's what I mean. I but, feel, you know, yeah. Yeah. Like, like your point before, like you were saying about this woman that you dated this, um, what's a pr proper term, slatternly woman, right? Like fall, fallen woman. Um, uh, <laughs> I love that term slatternly woman. I brought it back from the dead of the, of the 18th century. But um, yeah, you were saying like about how the sort of, I, I was watching your video on therapy. It was an excerpt from your podcast about like sort of how a lot of this behavior is due to like a uh, sort of childhood development or rather a uh, lack of a foundation and that you are yeah. seeing that a lot of like the excesses of ideology that we're seeing now, like basic progressive worldview, that that comes about from like more or less like a psycho. I know it's like psychologizing, but more or less it comes about from, you know, um, a disordered foundation in life. I guess like that's a yeah. huge impetus of your content as well so maybe if you like like for the like iterate like your criticism of that like the whole therapy thing that's another big thing on tiktok and twitter like go to therapy is like becoming well yeah yeah but even even right wingers will say like we have a mental health crisis then mm -hmm. okay uh no we don't because you're validating that there needs to be therapy i mean by saying there's a mental health crisis i think you're validating the, that the the solution would be someone to go on SSRIs or go to therapy or any of these things. And really, most of what I talk about, it's always the fact that the simplest solution is always probably the proper one. Mm -hmm. Like this notion, I mean, there's a lot, of, there's a lot smarter people than me that, that I follow, you know, like Benjamin Braddock, I like, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, he's a smart guy and he'll post something about how, uh, and then here comes this guy that actually has research and all that and says there is, but it's completely manufactured in the sense that people will have a so-called chemical imbalance when they're prescribed all sorts of things, when they're prescribed, uh, when women are prescribed birth control and then they're prescribed Zoloft and then they're prescribed Xanax and then they're prescribed like all of these things uh, that will actually create some sort of chemical imbalance because you're ingesting all of these pharmaceuticals. When in reality, like it's the simplest solution is the one that people should adopt to enact proper change in one's life. Like if you want to lose weight, uh, people are now taking Ozempic, which, so it's like, it's like people want some sort of quick fix and essentially there is, but it's, you have to, you know, go back to your ancestral roots in order to do that. And um, going to therapy and paying someone who probably doesn't have their together either money in, because you you want to like um unload on them so you're basically paying someone to unload on them and then dwell on the thing over and over and over again and never move past it um it's a modern day solution that isn't really a solution to a modern day problem hmm. when in reality in re reality like it this for, for men at least uh go lift heavy things get sun and eat better it, i mean it's it's it sounds so stupid saying it but i even like to say it like that like a caveman like go lift heavy thing get sun because it's that simple and and i don't know i mean i i i think well, people are over complicating things yeah well first of all i'm gonna have to on the youtube version might have to cut some things but let me just you do the usual disclaimer of we're not giving medical advice so youtube oh, yeah. algorithm please Sorry. we're not experts not giving medical advice um you know uh, all that st stuff please do not take our opinions that seriously um it was something very I'm interesting dumb. yeah yeah um it was very interesting though because um i only really started uh, losing weight when i started uh you know exercising regularly and like uh the fa fa intermittent fasting because i i tried with yeah. i think for a few months and i really didn't do oh, anything because no. here's another thing is that it doesn't do like it's not a miracle drug for uh percent like a good percentage of people that take it a lot of people yeah. take it it does nothing for them uh which they like of course now it's become a like a health fad um yeah. that's also worrying because you know i mean you're taking a diabetic drug and you're using an off-label use for it and it doesn't really yeah. have that yeah. you know but i know you get this criticism a lot when it comes to depression i do believe that there is severe clinical depression that people have but i mean 
I think like the medical industrial, like the psychomedical industrial complex that people have been uh, critiquing since the seventies, literally, you know, read Thomas Summers, yeah. right? Like it's like what you're saying is that the sort of the solution that people are getting, especially I hate to say it, young women when it comes to therapy is yeah. like sort of, it's like a very like commodified individualized stopgap for something deeply wrong within civilization and of course, like they're yeah. being bombarded with other chemicals as well. Like that's birth control, like since the time of like, like when do they start birth control now? 12 years old or something, 13 years old, I think. Like Dude, immediately. Yeah. It's crazy. And, and it's, yeah. it's, it's pure, it's pure evil. But like, imagine living a hedonistic lifestyle and then being like, why am I so sad? You know, <laughs> yeah. I, on my show, it's interesting because there's that brand him, hymns. I think it's like hymns and then hers, right? Oh, so yeah. hymns will. Yeah. Hims will sell men. Uh, it's interesting how this company sells different things to the the different the two different genders, right? So for men, Hims is your hair. You're losing your hair. You can't get your dick up, and I think those are like the two main ones. And then for women, the main one is to sell them um, uh, like SSRIs, you know, like yeah. the anti-depression medication. And I just think it's 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 interesting, like the that that both are are th those problems are are kind of obviously like it's the it's the one that can benefit the pharmaceutical industry the most yeah but they're not really they're not they're not really interested in tackling the real problem and the funny thing is actually for the men now that i think about it is um you're taking that that i forget what it's called but the hair loss thing uh, when you're norwooding yeah the, yeah yeah, and then and then you can't get hard because you're literally killing your testosterone levels with this other drug. So um, no one's really interested in in tackling the real problems. Like for instance, why are women so depressed? Um, when I whenever I mention technology on my show, I always mention how they're solving a problem. They're sol they're they're coming up with a solution for a problem that doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that's kind of the the case with everything. You know, so like, yes, modern people have depression. I assume people in the past also were depressed, but maybe they didn't really even have time to be depressed. And maybe they weren't so narcissistic and self-centered and, and maybe their lives had more meaning. But like, so they, their lives were probably harder. I mean, their lives were definitely harder. Oh, yeah. But their lives also probably had more meaning and they were probably closer to God and they didn't have the time to the the, the time or um luxury of being depressed i mean like to be depressed is is it's a luxury it's a first world problem you know uh, well they had a different consciousness than we do they had very much like this sort of like especially under uh, medieval christendom for instance like that was a totally different way of viewing the world than we do now like that's you know we can't even compare well yeah. right exactly and so so uh, i mean of course you're going to be depressed if you're completely plugged in if you're if you're doing everything that you're told to do by the by the the powers that be whatever you want to you know like if you take every piece of advice from so-called experts and apply it to your life of course that's going to be the end result of course you're going to be depressed um and it, it really is a, a luxury i mean even if you apply it to like westerners today against like even japanese people like the way that we look at the world is completely different yeah and i would say that that westerners are probably more individualistic um and they are they are more narcissistic and they are more self-centered and they're 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 probably m m more uh, uh disconnected from god or whatever it is that you want to you know say in that in that whole world of of like religion re religion and i i don't think that it uh the formula we have today i don't think it breeds happy people and i think maybe that's by design right yeah no even but even like japan is getting like westernized in a certain respect i mean they they have a different attitude towards like religiosity i mean they are largely a secular society although they have a different um like a lot of like more um you know in the east with a lot of like buddhistic societies it's like yeah. it's a different thing but they still have like a lot of their like even in japan you'll still find like folk traditions maybe not in tokyo but you'll find it elsewhere um, but even still, well, they're getting like somewhat westernized. 
like everyone else. They 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 are, but if if I uh maybe this is old, um, I don't know. I I wouldn't say stats, but maybe old information. Mm. Uh, the, don't the pharmaceutical industries like didn't they just give up on Asia? I think so. Yeah, I mean, to an I think China is still a huge market, but by and large, yeah. I mean, the pharmaceutical companies they they don't have a, a huge pull the way that they do in the West or in, in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, it's kind of curious. I wonder I mean, if there people, is. Yeah. yeah, people really in the states like they really took the bait on therapy. Um, they really took the bait. I mean, you know, the, the thing is, is, I mean, men and women look at that differently. And I think men are more hesitant to go to therapy, at mm -hmm. least men who don't live in cities. Um, but we, we, we used to rely on like neighbors. We used to rely on family. We, we, we're completely disconnected from even community. I mean, oh, that, that word community has been completely hijacked by, um, you know, these, these groups like BLM, whatever, whatever no, social it's, it's, justice. Group. It's like wholesome Chungus communitarian Marxism is sort of like, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Know? Like the, the very that, more that word actually, yeah. community actually was literal. It's not literal anymore. It's, it's, hmm. it's, it's kind of like this vague concept but in reality, when we were closer and when we had the generational household and all of that, like there was community and there, it was in the church, it was in the neighborhoods, it, people would rely on one another. Uh, you know, the more disconnected we've gotten from, from that whole worldview, the more people are embracing like paying for friends. I mean, I guess I actually like, yeah, in Japan, people pay for companionship and I'm not yeah. even talking about school and people, I guess, do it differently, but kind of the same way in the states the hugging where bars, you, yeah the yeah bars. but in the states you're gonna you're, you're gonna pay for a therapist so i guess it's the same thing mm. and these are not trust me these are not people who have them together either so i don't know why people like people have literally been memed into going to therapy thinking that that's a solution yeah i mean but also like when it comes to community like well we'll get to the community but you said um, you went to therapy a few times or you have a history and then you sort of uh, critiqued it. Uh, what was your experience like? Um, maybe, I'm, maybe, getting, no, I, maybe I'm getting fake news, I mean, but, you know. Well, I've never really been to therapy. I mean, I I, I used to work in a shared workspace and I, the, I guess like people, this is even before, oh, you can't say that on YouTube, the real pandemic, the real serious <laughs> pandemic. Um, people were doing like video conferencing and all that in, in yeah. the shared workspace. Yeah. It's kind of like Soho house. It was in Los Angeles when I lived there and there was like this fat pig of a lady who she's a life coach. <laughs> oh, oh man! And in like, you could tell she's not married, no kids, you know, pro she had fur on her clothes because she has pets, you know, that kind of woman. And she's nonstop call after call, giving people advice and I'm just like, what has the world, like, what has happened to the world where people go to someone like this for advice? It's like, it's like if, if you went to a doctor and he was morbidly obese, like, would you trust this doctor? I mean, I wouldn't. And it's the same thing. Like, you have to judge a book by its cover. You have to, like, if your therapist doesn't have together, what are you doing going to this person? Um you know, maybe, maybe I have gone. I don't know if I have, I, honestly, I, maybe I blocked it out. I can't remember going to therapy. I feel like maybe it's something that I did. Well, that sounds like uh, a very long house situation there. <laughs> like the, literally, yeah. I know it's become a meme term. Uh, shout out to my friend Lomez, but uh, that's, that literally is like a long house, like, um, you know, childless older woman uh, giving you life advice is sort of in the, you it's, know, yeah. It's bizarre. It's yeah. bizarre. And for, for people to be so obsessed with experts now, I mean, it really, it's the NPCs, like that type of person mm. to really care about experts. I mean, they're really not vetting these people because, uh, you know, it, I'll give you an example. I'm, I'm 36. So growing up, um, you know, I lived in the, in the golden age of diversity, you know, like yeah. don't judge a book by its cover. That what, what was that Michael Jackson song? that I, it came out when i was in kindergarten but i vividly remember it like where you know like the oh yeah. not man in the mirror 
No, that was no. But but it was it, the the gist of the song was like everyone around the world's the same and everyone you know I forget oh, what yeah. it's called. It came out in probably like ninety two or ninety three, whatever. Massive song, and and golden age of diversity. So I grew up with like not a single uh, bad thought with regard to race or anything. Like I I I never ever in my life growing up did I ever look at a black person and think like oh poor them or they're lesser than me or anything like that. Um, and I grew up by not judging a book by its cover because like you could be you could be memed into believing these things and, and it does, you know, take a hold on you, mm. especially when you're young and impressionable. But if you are open to, if you're open to like reality, the older you get and, and you can break away from the false God of diversity, um, then you're going to start realizing like that, this whole notion that you shouldn't judge a book by its cover and all that it's completely false. When you start noticing patterns, you start realizing that that whole worldview is Mickey Mouse. It's not real. It would be you nice. Start if noticing, it were real. yeah. You start noticing. You notice. <laughs> yeah. You notice yeah. things. But yeah. I guess, I guess, like the majority of people, not on the corners of Twitter that we live, you know, but like the majority of people probably still live in that world where they're going to ignore reality. They're going to ignore patterns. So they they might still have that. Um, worldview that they shouldn't judge a book by its cover they might still have that worldview that like oh this woman might be morbidly obese and she might not have a family but maybe she has some good advice to give so i'm open to listening to her and now i wouldn't um because i have eyes <laughs> no i think it's funny because being like i mean you're an older millennial i'm like core millennial i just turned 30 in december uh it's like i think the the difference being is that i think we grew up in a world where the the sort of like the the ideology the indoctrination was starting really hardcore you know but at the same time we lived in like more or less uh, a western world that still somewhat functioned and didn't have like right. huge shifts in like both demographics and religiosity right. and culture and so it's like you could you could accept like the John Stewart 90s liberalism for what it was right but as time goes on, like post, I would say 2008 or even like when the towers fell, like it's like the world fundamentally transformed into like, you know, I mean, some of the stuff we can't even say, you know, online, but basically, yeah, I mean, you nowadays, the Zoomers growing up, they don't live in that world anymore. They live in a fundamentally you, transformed society. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I noticed? Um, probably because I live on TikTok now. <laughs> it's the worst place <laughs> on the world. Um, you know what I noticed? is that there's a lot of like get rich quick schemes on yeah. TikTok. Oh yeah. And 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 it's it I think it works for some of these zoomers and it's very clickbaity and and I I can see why people are very attracted to it. And I think it has to do with the fact that they they are the first generation to grow up in a world where the system the mask is off. Yeah. Everyone knows that it's all BS. Everyone knows that the system is is not functioning and everyone knows that we are on the Titanic and it's sinking and they have to get theirs while they can. Mm. And I think that like the Zoomers, maybe subconsciously, I don't think this is like a conscious thought they're having, but subconsciously they're all playing these scams. They're all like doing these viral things that like prey on the naive and that they, they, they are able to get the attention and the eyeballs from these people because um, they on a subconscious level know that the world is that everything is fraudulent. Everything exists because everyone's ripping each other off Yeah, and they know it, you know, I don't know. It's, it's super, super interesting, but I don't think it's a conscious thing. I think it's completely subconscious. Well, that's an interesting point because it seems like that there is like an unconscious sort of like uh, rats, you know, getting off the sinking ship, sort of like panic mode. Um, yeah. There, and it's funny because there is a lot of, I think, I think also because the Zoomers grew up in, in the spectacle fully. They don't have like the millennial, like Norwood nostalgia, like, oh my God, my heckin' wholesome childhood. But also like you were saying, like in times of panic, there tends to be like a lot of like brutal, um, fantastical, a fantastical view of the world where scamming and like, creating a facsimile of reality that's not there that becomes acceptable because you figure like well if society in general 
is like on the downward trend, then it's like, who cares? Right. It's like, I might as well, like you were saying, like, I might as well get mine. And that's a very interesting phenomenon because I feel like us millennials, we like bent the knee to it. And we sort of like want to turn ourselves off from reality. But the Zoomers, they have a fundamentally different experience. So I don't yeah. know, like, what's it like being an older millennial? Like, people around you, do you notice, like, people, like, older millennials, like, there, there's a certain, like, attitude that prevents us from action. There's a certain, like... Um, well, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know what I've noticed? So, I guess, like, technically, if you were born in 1980, you're, like, still... You're not Gen X. You're you're the beginning of millennials, millennial, I think. Yeah. I, yeah. You know what I've noticed with them, especially aesthetically, is they are they are boomers it's like cyclical <laughs> yeah you know? we are like, spiritual so gen boomers. X, yeah. yeah they are spiritual boomers because like gen x were um kind of rebellious towards the boomers but like with this i don't really care and i'm also i don't get really offended by things i kind of yeah, like the MTV gen attitude yeah. yeah yeah but but the the older millennials like the ones even older than i am um they have the worst taste in everything um <laughs> they it's true <laughs> they they um when they hear me talk about certain things i talk about they they are looking at me like i'm an alien like they have no clue what i'm talking about because they still believe in the system the same way that boomer i think the hatred towards boomers is that they think that the system is still functioning so yeah. they're wondering why um why are we looking for help and Another thing with regard to boomers is that they um, they were basically born in like the most into the most prosperous time ever in human history. And yeah. they think in human history. So they're almost the first generation because of that, that it came so easy to them that they think it's going to come easy to everyone after them. And th since they think that way, they're not really into uh, generational wealth. They're not really into preserving the family. They're not really into um you know uh, uh what's it uh nepotism they're not into yeah. nepotism which like that's literally ingrained in humans how we're supposed to, what do you think that's last names are all throughout human history you know it's been the norm yeah. yeah our last name is the trade that we were passed that like that our fathers passed down to us so nepotism is as natural and as wholesome and as um you know it's, it's like the it's like the best form of anything that we should yeah. what do you think the rothschilds are doing you know what I mean? Like, how do you think that they're still the richest family in the world and no one even talks about them? But whatever. Um, so that's kind of another thing with with boomers that, like, we're frustrated with. But um, the older portions of millennials, they are boomers mm. aesthetically and, and philosophically. Like, they think everything is functioning as it should. And it's it's weird, you know? Yeah, it's, you know, like maybe, the irony left maybe, is they're like that. They're all, all older millennials. You know, you know, yeah, irony maybe, leftists, maybe. you know what I'm talking about, right? There's something awful people that while well, they were on something awful, like they're sort of like they are account. They're the ones that tell you that like to touch grass and like, you know, yeah. I'm edgy. I'm like older millennial John Stewart. I don't care about anything, right. but I do care about the reigning ideology. I do care about like trans rights or whatever. Like that's a very weird right. dichotomy. Yeah. Sorry. I cut you off, Josh. Go yeah. Ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, that that's, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're in like a weird position because I think, or at least I am like, um, I think at heart, I, I align more with the zoomers than I do with my own generation. <laughs> uh oh, you try to hello fellow kids. Um, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. I know what you but, mean. Like, um, yeah, go ahead. I don't know. No, I, I was going to say, I, I just, yeah. You go ahead. You go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. No, I was going to ask you, like, aesthetically, though, you you think the older millennials are also kind of, like, boomerish? Like, how? what do you mean by that? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, man, it's so hard to explain. But, like, I, I guess there's, like, family friends of mine that I, uh, I, you know, I grew up with, but they're, you know, six, seven years older than me. And, and uh you know i know them because they were friends with my brother and all that so like i'll follow a few of them on on instagram and that they post or the way that they advertise their businesses or the way that they use instagram or the way that they like I, I, it's 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 hard to explain it's i don't know they're very like you know, direct maybe, and there's no like nuance like a lot of boomers that post are like that 
There's like no nuance. Yeah. 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 And they definitely aren't cool. They definitely (laughs) don't care about, they don't care about, this is, maybe this is a better way to explain it. Because when I'm explaining these sorts of things, I have to have someone in mind, like someone specific. Okay. They don't really care about beauty. Mm. And I think that's kind of it. Um, And I think that that might be something, one of the traits that boomers handed down to us. Because post-war boomers, again, were the first generation to grow up in a world that didn't care about beauty anymore. That only cared about utilitarian kind of things. Like, things need to just work. Yeah. But they, they, they don't need to have... um they don't like they don't really need to care about craftsmanship and they don't really need to care about like beauty it just they just need to make something yeah yeah and i think that's kind of it so like even if like they advertise their businesses you know someone like sam hyde for instance i wouldn't say his stuff is beautiful but it is thought like there's a lot of thought put into it there's a very unique aesthetic that comes from the early internet that comes from different influences and editing Ex- remix culture yeah exactly and the straightforwardness maybe we're talking about is like hi i'm a real estate uh agent this is the house you should buy i'm here in the uh blah 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 condo on miami beach this is the amenities blah 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 and they're thinking like that's gonna sell their apartment that they're posting on instagram you know you know what i mean i it's very vague what i'm saying but like they really don't care about beauty. It's I, it's it's so hard to like. I'm very obsessed with things things needing to be pretty and nice mm-hmm. again. For yeah. instance, like I I recently st- started to get into smoking cigars and all of that kind of stuff, and I keep like texting people and I'm like, hey, do you know where I can find like a really pretty cigar case or really like you know and no one knows you know what i mean like you can search for something that works on amazon or etsy or wherever but nothing's really pretty anymore and then you go back a hundred years ago to to things that were sold in the 1920s and like everything the craftsmanship was incredible Mm -hmm. things were made and built to last but also that there was it things were just inherently beautiful and boomers don't care about that i don't know what gen x thinks but millennials older millennials don't care younger millennials only care about minimalistic things and which to me suck as well you know they're soulless <laughs> the ikea I don't aesthetic know. yeah like I hate the it, dude. new international yeah yeah um yeah there, there's i know that this said about the millennial but yeah go ahead no, I'm I'm like for people listening, I know that I'm being vague and I know that this isn't like the most sexy topic, but you know, I had an awakening listening to Roger Scruton when I was living in Los Angeles. Hmm. And and I always knew something was off about Los Angeles. Like I always knew that I didn't really like the environment. And this is before the real downfall that like if you go there now, certain parts just look like they were bombed. Um, so this is still when it was okay. Um, and, and I always knew that like, just something about it, like kind of made me miserable. And, and first of all, it's not walkable. Second of all, a lot of stucco, a lot of just terrible architecture. Um, a lot of kitsch, like a a lot of, yeah, kitschy. Yeah. Yeah. Soulless concrete wasteland. Um, there are remnants of a once greater civilization, like in downtown LA, there's remnants of beautiful old art deco buildings. Um, even obviously, obviously New York city has a lot of those. Mm -hmm. Um, but for, for the most part, just everything is completely soulless and devoid of character, devoid of beauty. Um, and it's a, it's a shame. Yeah. 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 That, that is, that is very important. Um, I, I think like uh, when it comes to millennials, I mean, certainly there was a moment where like there was like the hipster eclecticism, but that sort of faded out. Like you could say that the hipster genuinely did care about culture that was niche, but it was also like gaudy and like, Ill, like not very well put together. But at the same time yeah. that the, then when they became older, uh, then they became so egalitarians where 
the soy egalitarian like consumes like the mass slop marvel yeah. movie yeah like you know, you know like it I really yeah it really took root you know yeah yeah it, it really took control you know you know it's interesting because i'm uh i was thinking about like when i i moved to la probably around 2010 mm. and you know there was the the, the woke stuff was non-existent it was still kind of like off of the hipster stuff from the early 2000s where um you know people were pr promiscuous there was no me too um you know yeah and uh it's interesting because like some whenever i talk about la i always end up thinking about the movie under the silver lake yes yeah great story and movie yeah. you, you, you know um that movie it was pretty much shot in like 2016 or 17 and they shelved it for like two years yeah that's right and it's funny because when they released it they released it around the time where la was sucking and when it was made it was still on the cusp of like where we are now and where we were before so the vibe of that movie is still of the coming off of the kind of like hipster la thing where yeah yeah like it did it did have a lot to say about the casting couch stuff kind of in a more subtle way than people would do now mm -hmm. um but that that stuff is like has been around for forever in hollywood so it wasn't like necessarily you know embracing any sort of wokeism but uh the the vibe of that movie was of the la that's no longer existing i don't know if, if if you guys have never watched it you should watch it it's a really good movie i think it was great because it shows that behind the spectacle is literally nothing like it sort of it, yeah. it takes you into sort of like the usual underbelly conspiracy film but then at the end of it is a very like um it, it upends that statement in saying that yes there is a conspiracy yes they do want to be immortal but really it's like not as um it's more pedestrian it's more not pedestrian it's more like uh fantastical than you think because people fundamentally yeah. crave a narrative but behind that is the way they subvert that narrative is very telling yeah. right so that was yeah. such a brilliant film that way because i feel like it was a commentary on the fact that even Hollywood and Los Angeles, you know, California itself is a spectacle machine that even produces its own criticism that behind it yeah, is that, nothing. That, so, yeah. That, the, the, the life of that movie is very meta because mm, it, yeah. the, the way that it was treated almost justifies everything it was saying. You know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like the conspiracy and all that is true because of how they treated it, how they shelved it for two years, how they dumped it in theaters and didn't um, uh, advertise it at all. And then also it seems like the filmmaker has been blacklisted, like he hasn't done anything since then. Yeah. And the movie he made before that was was insanely successful. It was It Follows, that horror it movie. It Follows was a huge, huge millennial hit. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, but a really good movie, and and also almost a uh, a champion for you know not being promiscuous. You know, it was like almost like a conservative manifesto. Yeah, you know. Yeah, like, it had a lot um, of simpery as well. It it showed you like how the the pitfalls of simpery. That's another. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, kind of, yeah. So yeah. it's just weird that that filmmaker he made this movie that exposed the truth, and he hasn't been able to make a movie since. You know. Yeah, it's yeah, it was so subversive that then it became a call classic. They sort of couldn't contain it. Yeah. Um now like a yeah. like weirdo theory cells love it. So, you know, and yeah. that um did you work in the industry at all? You were you did some stuff or? Um kind of. I mean I my life is is really weird because, you know, I grew up in a wealthy household, but then mm. we kind of like the Bluths and Arrested Development, we kind of lost it all, but we're still able to maintain kind of like kind of a wealthy lifestyle. Mm. Um, so we can go back to like 2007 and I co-produced a Paris Hilton movie. Because, That's right. Um, yeah. Yeah. You have the IMDb yeah. credit. Yeah. Did you work yeah, with her directly? There. Of course. Like, Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you know, I, I, I co-produced that because my family's company at the time put money into that movie and, um, what's interesting is that because of that movie, there was other people in that little world of that movie set that like knew 
what my involvement in that movie was. So they wanted to meet with me so they can get money to make their movie. Mm. And you want to know what's interesting is that one of those people was this guy, Joel David Moore, who was the head actor, like the main actor of that movie. Now he is in the Avatar movies. He's that tall, skinny dude who was in Grandma's Boy. I don't know if you ever saw that where he like Thanks. pretends he's, a, he thinks he's, yeah, whatever. No. Besides the point. So he wanted to meet with, me and my family uh to help him and his friends make a movie and we almost were, were we were like kind of thinking about it so we met with them now his friends were zachary levi who's like a very famous actor now he's that shazam guy and their oh. other friend was huh oh yeah yeah i was saying yeah i think i've seen and then around. the other friend was jeremy boring who oh, is the CEO no of the Daily Wire. Oh my god. Yeah. We, it's yeah. funny because me and my friend Prudentialist, we uh we do our live show every every Thursday, and m me, him, and Kino Corner, we reviewed the Daily Wire films. The three of them. Oh. That came out. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean not not, yeah. not great and, and films, but you know. No. Yeah, but no, but that's that's like the whole crazy thing. It's like, you know, even my past life where i was trying to be in the entertainment industry uh i i like come i i come in contact with these people who are massive now like i i think jeremy would remember me mm. but he's he's like the ceo of the biggest conservative company in the world yeah over a million subscribers and he's like he now he's like the face of it you know he before he just wanted to be a filmmaker he came begging us for money for his films like like you know and now he's this massive influential ceo that has ben shapiro and matt walsh and yeah little and ben Jordan is giving him money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's so it's just so bizarre um so i mean i tried doing that stuff for a little bit but then it's kind of like I just I I I I kind of I guess realized Hollywood and all that is just pointless and mm. just kind of disgusting and for a little bit I tried maybe acting and I was actually genuinely good at it but I I was terrible at auditions and all of that. Yeah. Um and then because I dated that girl um she kind of like basically uh forced my hand into becoming the man I am today, which is doing this, but it's just bizarre. Like that whole world is so small. And the fact that like Jeremy boring want, was, was, you know, trying to meet with us and trying to get money from us. And then now he's massive and you know, the head of that company, it's just really crazy. What do you think of the daily wire films? Have you watched any? No, but I don't like the Daily Wire. I think yeah. the Daily Wire is trash. Um, <laughs> I will say, I will say, yeah. um, uh, Matt Walsh is maybe the best of yeah, that world. Yeah, he's probably the best. You know, yeah. I, I, I kind of like him. Um, but I'll give you an example. This is something I spoke about on my show last week. I hate, I despise the conserv conservative response to stuff. Yeah. Uh, I hate. Um, I hate that the Daily Wire made a chocolate bar, which isn't a oh real chocolate bar. It, it's, it's it's white labeled. It's white labeled, so the margin sucks. So they're gonna um, have this based response to Hershey's, and they're gonna make their own chocolate bar and charge thirty <laughs> bucks per bar. And all the conservative boomers are gonna eat it up literally and buy a uh, hundred thousand bars in the first day because <laughs> we're gonna own. We're gonna own the libs that way. Owning the libs by the buying movies, stuff, the, yeah, yeah, by Hogwarts yeah, dude, Legacy the, to own the libs, yeah. The movies are the same. Uh, yeah. The books are the same. I was talking to a friend today, and I was like, "Listen, like I spoke about this on my show as well. I hate uh, conservative children's books, and I can oh. explain to you why very easily." So, a friend of ours, um, I get when our kid was born, bought us like a whole stack of brave books i guess it's like a publishing company yeah brave, brave is books. the big and they, yeah conservative yeah children's books so they get like lauren southern and they get jack posobic and they get all these people to write these based books for kids and my wife and i were flipping through them and we were kind of horrified we were like this is not good i'm not talking about like the the 
the writing is not good. I'm talking about the message is terrible because you're writing books for like six year olds about the second amendment or BLM. Like one of the BLM books was like all uh, like these, these, these cartoon characters, um, these cartoon animals holding up signs, like all pause matter or something. Right. And, and I'm like, this is actually horrific because the conservative response is, is exactly that. It's a response to what the left is framing, right. which is them creating the playing field and us always have to play defense by responding to them. So when you, when you, when your response to like a gay tiger book, which is like a tiger can have two dads or whatever, I don't know. I'm um, just like creating this. Um, and then yours is like co the complete opposite of that. You're losing and not only are you losing, but your content sucks. Yeah. And and a kid shouldn't be exposed to that um, because the best conservative children's book is, I don't know, The Berenstein Bears, where well, they, it's they like got a into papa and recently. a mama. Yeah. yeah. A papa and a mama going on a picnic with the kids. Zero politics in it. But the reason why it's the best is because it's depicting normalcy. And conservatives keep forgetting that the, the way that we need to project our messages hey look at us we're normal and we're happy not hey look at us uh like second amendment's awesome and freedom and you know i don't like what are you trying to say how is this appealing why are you telling kids this yeah i wonder how so many the boomers, daily wire sucks yeah i wonder how many boomers are going to buy their grand their, their you know uh their their grandkids the brave bucks i wonder if that's probably like the big market right like no but what it you're is, saying is though yeah what you're saying is 100 right because i feel like um if you wanted true right-wing messaging in uh children's books then you would have a sort of like a foundational message like for example um unabashed like young like a young boy going on an adventure and learning a foundational moral yeah. and virtue moral moral message but also a virtue as well heroism bravery uh civil like yeah. civility like though those like classic children's books like i grew up on the bernstein bears you know and it's like uh those yeah. things i feel like that should be the message not like the libs have like a book about timmy like like tommy has two mommies we're gonna have a book about like i don't know <laughs> like monster trucks and uh the second amendment and, yeah you know what i mean yeah like, uh, yeah yeah it, it 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 like what it is is that since the conservatives are constantly parroting the left yeah um they're they end up like becoming a parody themselves like if every product you have is like some sort of meme product yeah then you're memeing yourself not in a good way by the way <laughs> yeah yeah it's true no but like the daily wire films are like this as well like um the one is about right. the one was like the one, it's funny because I was so pissed off because they could have used Vincent Gallo so well, but they gave him like this yeah. like stupid role. He had like five minutes total in the film that they paid like a bunch of money for because uh, Vincent Gallo truly is like a transcendental actor, right? Uh, but yeah. they like it was about it literally was kind of like one of those like cheap like pure flicks Christian films about like drug addiction and a, but they're all the girl boss though. But see the. Daily Wire, they have their own girl bosses. Right. They have their own, like, huntress type of, like, woman that, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 So it's, it's like, this sort of marketing they, they, to boomers. They play, they play, yeah, and, 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 like, all of these companies, they play the same uh, identity politics game that the left does, but it's worse. Yeah. We have our gay black conservative and, and you know, but you know like we have him so we're not we're not homophobic we're not racist how about let's embrace all the ists like yeah we are homophobic yeah we are racist yeah we are <laughs> it's true no it's true did you see um who's a politician from virginia that got elected because he dude glenn youngkin youngkins yeah, yeah. blumpkins yeah like, it's uh what did you see that clip where he like there was a an, an f2m trans person that yeah like that was so so I embarrassing. See, I yeah, see, embarrassing. I I was watching that and I'm like, what? How did we get back to pre-Trump? How <laughs> is this where we got back? Like that doesn't work. Yeah, and, and it's 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 cring. It's so cringe. I mean, man, I was thinking if I was in the shoes of Glenn Youngkin there, I would have 
I would have said, uh, you're a woman. Stone uh, you stay in the woman's bathroom. Yeah. I yeah. would have just been so straightforward. And 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 my advisors would have been and <laughs> but everyone online and everyone in the world would have cheered me on. But like the the people who control how politicians think they would have been in their pants. But he would have got elected mean, again. Known. They would have elected him again, his constituents. Oh my have, god. Yeah. The real real world people would have been like, Holy crap, you're the real deal. Holy crap, you just won the twenty twenty four presidential election. You're not even <laughs> running yet. Like you just won. You went further than Trump, honestly. Yeah. Like Yeah. It would have um, been great Trump for us. Made, yeah. I know. Trump would have made probably made a joke about like women weightlifting or whatever, you know, I don't know. Cause he always does like his bing bong boom, you know. Yeah. But but I would have gone so hard on that and, and people would have been their jaws would have been to the floor and I would have been the king of America. And, <laughs> yeah, and, Glenn Young, you, know, you, know, you would have never be a man. <laughs> dude, dude, what politicians need to realize is is like if you want to like, like first of all, break away from from the globalists, like just first of all, do that. But. There's that, and I'm going to butcher it, but there's that quote, uh, that Napoleon quote, where like he was, he said something to the gist of like, he became emperor because the crown was laying on the floor and he just picked it up. Mm, and yeah. that is literally America right now. Like if you just go balls to the wall, you will become God emperor of the United States. There will no longer be elections anymore. You will be king. And, and we need someone like that. But like the fact that that's, the best that we have to offer or like DeSantis against Trump or even the fact that Trump, I love Trump, but the fact that he's kind of the main guy, it's sad. Like there needs to be someone really powerful, someone ready to pick it up and, and, and just, but do you think in the 2024, like I, I predict the Republicans will probably have to take another mulligan. I think like, Maybe not they'll run Biden. I mean, that'll be a disaster, the Democrats. But the Democrats, I think, maybe have a good chance. I hate to say it. If, but, if the know. Republicans um, get up, get the, get the, if, they're, if, they, if they come to the realization that they need to play dirty, and yeah. I'm saying that because you're on YouTube, but you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, then, then there's a chance that, that, that Trump wins, but if they don't play dirty, he's not going to win. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. No, I mean, the young thing was fascinating though, because it revealed the problem with like the Republicans. Like there was a, there was this quote I saw like in the, the main video that got like 18,000 likes or whatever, uh, so many hundreds of thousands of views where I think it was like some trans activist saying like, he can't even look you in the eye as he oppresses you. And I'm thinking like, yeah, that's kind of true. Like he can't even look at you in the eye where he's like, he can't even like say the words like, no, you're a, you're a woman, you know, like that's what's so pathetic about it. And people, the enemy, like the, the, the left will just right. like, seize onto it because it's like, it's, yeah, they're, they're saying, things. they're saying it's because he's, um, you know, disrespectful and like, we're seeing that and we're saying that cause he's weak. Yeah, it's bad you know? faith because you've consented to their point that, you know yeah. what I mean? So, um, yeah. yeah, it's it's very sad. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it's uh, but I think things will hopefully get worse mm -hmm. um, because then that's the only way, that's literally the only way we can have change is like if it gets so bad that just everyday normal consuming uh, Americans, even right wingers who like love their NFL and football and whatever, um, things need to get worse for them to wake up because i mean i thought it would have been the lockdowns and i thought it would have been the 2020 election and yeah. all of that but i guess things really do need to get worse it needs to be something more drastic oh yeah 100 percent. i mean i think like again another it's the boomer truth regime as well of like you know don't rock the boat but also like this this weird like complacency i think like that's why those yellowstone memes are so popular because they can give you like in the daily oh, yeah. wire films like or like that as well they can give you the aesthetic of based or like old timey values, Norman Rockwell right. painting, but really those right. values, they don't really carry on. Like those values um, the in the hands of the boomers became like a lie because now it becomes like civility, but now it's the civility of like, um, you know, Oh, here we don't tolerate bigotry around these parts. Like that's, yeah. yeah it's like, yeah. it's inversion of it. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. That's um, true. The Yellowstone memes, yellow soy, yellow soy. Uh, but that's, you know, 
But now that I wanted to talk to you, like now that you mentioned it, um, because I'm fascinated by this because I feel like uh, Paris Hilton's a fascinating like cultural figure. Me just because I'm a millennial. Yeah. But like, what was it like working with her? But also like her legacy. Like she came out. I think it was a few years ago, or it was during the pandemic. She came out with like a video about her life, um, and it was like kind of revealing about like the Hollywood machine. But what was it like working with yeah. her? Yeah. What was that experience like? she she has an amazing work ethic um very very she you know the the that voice she does it's not how she talks in private like she's very very smart mm -hmm. you know what's interesting is that when she was at the height of her fame they they meaning like a lot of the people around her wanted her to give her opinion on stuff and this mm -hmm. is even before you know the world we live in now where like every celebrity has to be political and her and her main manager had a rule, which was we don't talk about politics and we don't talk about religion. You know, we don't want to alienate people. And I thought that was, um, in retrospect, very commendable and, you know, actually a very smart move. Um, but she she's very smart, but also she oddly infantilizes herself. And that's like that baby voice she does, which, yeah. you know, the way she talks in interviews and. I I don't fully understand why she does that. May, maybe to avoid talking about things in a more serious manner. Mm. Um, yeah. But I think at heart, she, like she's, she, you know, her persona, she's cool with the gays and it's still like remnant of like the pre we just we want to get married and we want to like have designer babies kind of like gay. 2000s like 2000s type of yeah. Uh, yeah so she has like a soft spot for them but i think like it, deep down she's probably uh conservative um i know that her family and the trumps used to be close um and yeah. And I, I, I don't know. I mean, she, she's very interesting. She's definitely um, a lot more smart and calculated than like people would give her credit for. Um, I don't know, but I like her. I like her. I, I, I like her and her family a lot. I think like she's aware of the industry she's in, like the, the whole like infantilization, the neoteny of it. I feel like that persona was probably like a put on as like a commentary maybe i'm just making too much of it and intellectualizing it but it's almost like a commentary of like the way the entertainment industry is going and the way that you have to like become like she really was almost like the proto e-girl in a way like you know what i mean like, yeah i mean she, yeah. she she's the first influencer really yeah like, she's the first modern day influencer i mean like the fact that she created literally created um kim kardashian and that yeah, whole right. dynasty it, right. it really comes from paris like it's directly connected to her um, is fascinating because it's almost as if the reality we live in now was created by Paris Hilton. Yeah. 100%. I mean, it's, it's so, and I was in the thick of it, you know, I one time was uh, out with Paris and this is like maybe 2005 or Man, something. That was her heyday. We were yeah. Out, yeah. Dude, we were out in South beach and whatever. And then like, I blink and I'm in her hotel room and in Paris's hotel room. And then I, I wake up the next morning and I see some girl packing Paris's luggage and you know, all of that. And that girl was Kim Kardashian. I was in the same room as Kim Kardashian. Kim yeah. was Paris's assistant and she was packing up her luggage and all that. She was, she was Paris's gopher. She was the young but, girl, as they say in wrestling, the young boy. Yeah. Young girl. Do, yeah. Yeah. And like l the world we are living in today can be directly linked back to Paris Hilton. It's yeah. bizarre. Incredible. Like even, do you remember when she wore that shirt, stop being poor? What was it? Uh, just don't be poor. Yeah. 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 But it's very like Warholian in that like she's, yeah, she's like accentuating the contradictions of pop culture that she helped create, but also is like, yeah. T to me, I interpreted that as like um, the sort of like materialism of the the world that she was a spectacle of. Because you got to remember, like Paris Hilton became famous right in the cusp of when the internet took over everyone's lives. Like yeah. it, there was still like in the two thousands, there was still like that moment 
like again maybe just again because i'm a millennial so it's like nostalgia but like it was that moment like right before the internet took over everyday life so like the the, the media and like the, the spectacle of the paparazzi was still like still had some sway over people yeah yeah and then she like blew up was, on the internet like she was one of the first like internet yeah. gossip celebrities yeah yeah i mean it was also before the social media and the yeah. smartphone and all of that i mean it's 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 almost as if the people creating the tech around that time uh um used her as a as a guidebook almost of like yeah. what the future will be yeah. and and you know the 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 whole famous for being famous uh thing that stems from basically her and now there's thousands upon thousands of offshoots of hers and now it's not weird to see people who are famous for being famous now we just say oh yeah that's just normal it's all normal whereas when it was her it was the first yeah. but now there's you know in any kind of category oh she's a tiktoker like what does that mean oh hmm. no but she's a tiktoker oh th that that's a youtuber oh she has only fans you know what i mean like everyone is a uh, a uh, knockoff of her uh, it yeah. all goes back to paris hilton what do you think Paris Hilton would be like nowadays? If say she was like 1920 again, what would the Paris Hilton making it just as big nowadays look like? Would it be different or because she was so foundational and like the template of the influencer and the e-girl, like it would be the same. Like I I'm trying to wonder like what would Paris Hilton in the world of 2023 look like? I wonder like, I mean, she's still, I, I, she's still alive. She still exists. Paris Hilton's still alive, but you no, know, I, I know, mean, I get it. Expect, I, I mean, yeah. 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 Like if she was eight, if she was like a teenager now, I mean, she, she and, and she was the daughter of like the the hotel moguls and whatever, and she grew up in Beverly Hills. Or, I mean, she would use that to her advantage, and she would try to. Um, I think she would still try to be famous for being famous. It, it, it's like it's almost like a like she had no other choice. Yeah. You know, like if she yeah. was born. If she was born in 2000 and she would be, you know, 23 right now, like that, she would be where she is. It would yeah. be the same life. Yeah. She would have zero choice. She's going to be famous for being famous. Maybe she'd have an OnlyFans. It wouldn't be a tape. It would be an OnlyFans. I mean, yeah, yeah. But the thing is, like, when this tape came out, um, that was shocking. Yeah, it was. It was, it, it was like, either you're a star or you're not. Yeah. And then she blurred those lines. And she brought like a sense of realism, like, oh, I'm just a normal rich person. And I so happen to be in a and then Kim Kardashian literally copied her and then, you know, used the same jumping off point as Paris did and then got even bigger. But but yeah, I mean, she would maybe have an OnlyFans now because it's just a normal it's become so normalized to the point where they even call it X work where before you're all but now it's no it's work it's just a normal it's a normal job it's not weird it has been completely normalized to the point where um it, it, you could be you could be legitimate in the eyes of the masses by just saying i'm a sucker yeah yeah like that's but that's the crazy thing of, of that though it's like paris hilton was a spectacle unto itself but now it's like you have like c-list celebrity celebrity women doing it it's like well i mean yeah. even even that's how naive we were even like uh 22 years ago or 20 years ago we were so naive like that that and and more wholesome in that sense that you know that was shocking yeah and the stuff that people are exposed to now is so depraved and also at the same time so normalized yeah that that it's so backwards now that again it goes back to my point like if you're a conservative and you want to sell your ideology just show how happy and normal you are but yeah i gotta ask you this one last question would be does the soylent guy does he know it's a meme is it a meme or does he believe in like the mission he must know about the whole like soy connotation oh. Like he's already out of it like i think he sold it i think he mm. sold it to pepsi i don't know i don't know for how much oh man but yeah I, he do, he doesn't live his life like that um but that's fascinating because like the soil and thing is like such, like it's a foundational meme at this point like the, they have yeah, like the yeah. grip so you could like yeah. open it you know what you know what's you know what's funny is that 
that's a really good example of like that type of person. Mm. And that's a really good example of like the tech industry as a whole. Um, it's an individual who meant well, like who yeah. genuinely thought he was solving a problem, but in reality, he was um, solving a problem that didn't exist. Yeah. That he thought existed. And he, it was right place, right time, I guess, where people are looking to that side of the world uh, where they think like, this is where all the geniuses are. So anything new that comes from there inherently has to be good. Yeah. So people are ready. People are ready to like throw a lot of money behind a lot of these things because right now the whole world has been memed into thinking like that's where the genius is. That's where they all are. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, he's, he's, he is a smart guy, but he, um, he probably knows now, but he, at the time, he was solving a problem that just didn't exist. It's very much like Silicon Valley ideology of, like, that's, yeah. there's still that lingering, like, utopianism from the 90s, I feel. that. Well, my problem, yeah. my problem with them is that since we live in a post-God world, which is a shame, in my mm -hmm. opinion, they are now the gods on Earth. So yeah. they're all trying to, you know, I always, I always mention this movie, Only God Forgives. Which oh yeah, my it's it's one of my favorite movies ever, and it's completely misunderstood. I mean, the movie is literally about a guy trying to kill, fight God. He's a, a guy who is literally trying to fight God. That's what the movie's about, hmm. and that is exactly what these Silicon Valley people are. They live in a post God world, so they think that they can take the place of God, and they're they are. They don't know this, but they are more naive than you and I mm. because of that. You cannot fight God. You cannot kill God. And you can't replace him. Yeah, even Nietzsche went insane in the end. Like that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like the mess. Well, even Nietzsche went insane yeah. in the end, right? Like the messenger. Yeah. Of, yeah. Like, well, he meant like death of God is like the social picture of the way we believe in metaphysics. He, That's what he meant. Like he yeah. didn't mean like you know the he meant like the coming age of atheism and the last man yeah because it's true like the way that like for example the medieval the medieval peasant believed in god way differently than the way that we believe in god like even a trad cath would admit that or or a trad orthodox or a uh, you know practicing muslim yeah. you know yeah so that's what he meant but you're right like i mean the naivety of it is kind of scary in a way that they believe that they have the ability or through sheer human reason, they could like yeah. solve whatever problem. That is kind of scary in a way. Um, they're not hardened yeah. to and, reality. Uh, uh? Well, they're not hardened to like the reality of things in a way. It's a bubble. They're in a bubble. Yeah. I mean, they're they're so naive and they don't even know it. Yeah. It's interesting. Very but interesting. It's it's um, there there's gonna have to be a reset from that mindset because it's it's not gonna end well. Thank you for listening to the Content Minded Podcast, where every Wednesday there are interesting guests, amazing ideas, solo streams, and discussions on a diverse array of topics from art, philosophy, history, and more. The free version will be available both here on YouTube and as a downloadable link on Anchor and Spotify, as well as on Substack. Each week, the full uncensored and spicier version will now be available on both Patreon and Substack where you will have access to the full archive of both Content Minded and of Giant Reviews where I break down interesting texts every week, including other exciting paywalled articles and good content. Thank you all. Please like, share, and subscribe. God bless. Goodbye. Help keep the content renaissance alive. Too sweet.